So now we're moving to our final panelist. I knocked off my own mic there, <laughs> Rachel Moran. Rachel, you're very welcome. Uh, of course, I should say, sorry, our final Irish panelist. So Rachel, you're very welcome all together to make your presentation here to our inaugural event. Thank you very much, Christy. And, and I'd like to open, excuse me, by saying a huge thank you to Annette because that is, it's a very moving um, presentation, I should hope for every Irish woman, but for many, many of us, myself included, we share a similar legacy. Um, my own mother was born in Castle Pollard, mother and baby home, which recently got the disgraceful air and it deserved um, in the media. Uh, although I'm sure we'll never get to the fullness of the truth, but I just want to say, you speak for so many women in it, not just here in Ireland, but of the diaspora all over the world. And many, many women and men for that matter are of the diaspora precisely for this reason. So I think that that's something that's important to stay here. Um, so I'm going to give the briefest history of working class Dublin you'll ever hear in your life. Um, I, I've got 10 minutes, which is all any of us have, and all we can give is a very, very brief snapshot of the, the area that we feel deserves covering. Um, it may not be known to many people outside Ireland and even many within Ireland either uh, are not fully aware, um, for some probably frankly don't care, and many did and to this day benefit from the fact that for two straight centuries in this city, one full third of the city's population were raised in the Dublin slums, which were more commonly known as the tenements. I'm sorry for the little ping pong and I couldn't figure out how to turn my sentence off. So apologies to everybody. Now, <clears throat> if you want to read an oral history, this book here, Dublin Tenement Life um, by Kevin C. Kearns really is the book to read because this is the personal stories themselves. It's an oral history and the true uh, tradition of the word. Um, there are probably a hundred or more people's own personal testimonies recorded in that book. And the reason why it's important to bring up where we came from um, it, in terms of our class-based background is that it intersects with, with sexism for a particular way for the working class women of this nation. Um, a second book that's an interesting read is The High Society by Justine Delaney Wilson, which is a book that really gives you an insight into how the habits, the modern day habits and behaviours of the middle and upper middle classes impact dreadfully harmfully on, on working class people in this city and every other city and village and town. Um, because what we're really looking at here is, is a, a class stratified society that is so deep and so immovable that actually academic studies have been done into the, the whys and wherefores. It's so difficult to move between the classes in the Irish context. Um, three of my four grandparents were born and raised in the Dublin slums. Um, one of them was from a farm down in County Kerry. And um, we're much, much closer to that piece of history than, than a lot of people realise. The areas that we would have considered satellite towns, you know, in, in recent decades, like Cabra and Finglas and Talla, were built or developed in the first place in order to facilitate the people from the slum clearances from Dublin's north and south inner city. And um, both of my parents in the 50s would have been moved out. Um, you know, my, my mother from Rutland Street, just up the road, actually, to just off Mount Dry Square, and my father's side of the family from the Liberties up to Cabra. So people really need to understand, I suppose, if, they, if they're interested at all about class, the intersection of class and sexism in Ireland, what was really going on here? Um, there, there has been an enormous whitewash, I would say, at all, at all levels of our history. And I think probably the biggest thing, although it was a scandal in its day, but it's never ever discussed now, um, it's the fact that at the point when the tenement housing started to physically collapse in upon its inhabitants, killing entire families and buildings full of families, which were, by the way, herded together like cattle, 10, 15, 20 to a room in these tenements. It was then discovered that the landlords were if a huge, to a huge degree, actually members of, of Dublin Corporation, which, you know, now known as 
Dublin City Council. So what you were looking at was a kind of a cannibalization in the social sense of Dublin people by other Dublin people. And I know that that's a very strong word to use, but if you take a look at this history and what actually went on in this city, um, to give you an example, when my, my auntie um, emigrated to the United States in the early 1960s and I'd asked her why she'd left and her response really shocked me. We had this conversation the books of 20 years ago and she said, because I was sick of looking at barefoot children rifling through bins looking for something to eat. So that's, that's how close we are to that piece of history. It's in our auntie's times. Um, and, and why is this relevant today? Well, it's relevant for a whole lot of reasons that I don't have enough time to go into. But what I will, I'll give you two examples. Um, one is what's going on right now um, in, in terms of abortion in this country. So we've been told that abortion now was free, safe, legal. Well, it's free, safe, legal, you depend on who you are. And that's the reality. Because when a woman is, and particularly women who are 40 years plus, who are in the danger zone for fetal abnormalities, what pe a lot, I've never heard this mentioned, by the way, in, in the media, which doesn't surprise me. Because the media, just like academia, just like the NGO world and so on and so forth in this country, is dominated, not predominantly, but almost all, by middle and upper middle class people. So you won't hear this from the, exactly the circles you ought to hear it from. But if you go into a maternity hospital in this country, any maternity hospital, you will not be tested for fetal abnormalities until you're 20 weeks. And now you have the option to go private, which is possible for from nine weeks forward. But here's the thing, the cost attached to that simple test is 485 euros. Now that is four, five, six weeks grocery money for a lot of women in this country, be they disadvantaged working class, um, be they from the traveler community, be they migrant women. There's hundreds of thousands of women in this country who could not dream of stumping up nearly half a grand for a test to let them know in time at nine weeks whether or not they are making a decision that they can in fact live with for the rest of their lives. Um, and that is a huge thing that we need to wrestle and grapple with in this country. Because by the time you're 20 weeks pregnant and you are tested on the, on the public course, you're eight weeks beyond the point where you can have an abortion. You're halfway through your pregnancy. And that is, it's an enormous uh, repercussion for women. And we've got to put that on the table and quickly. And it's absolutely directly connected to social class and to the fact that what we have in this country constantly is middle class decisions impacting on working class lives. We've had it for centuries. It has not gone anywhere. It needs to go somewhere soon. Um, I'm assuming, Christine, I must be heading on for me 10 minutes. I forgot to put down. <laughs> How far in am I now? Um, I mean, you're getting there all right. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> I always get there in the end. Okay, now the final point I'd like to make. Um, you have two minutes. You have two minutes left, Rachel. Okay, well, I could do this in two hours, but I'll, I'll squeeze it tight. Um, yeah, misogyny from a class perspective. We have got to talk about women's prisons and the absolute nonsense that we have got blokes in frocks walking around women's prisons because of decisions that were made by middle-class women with zero consultation with the working-class women who are liable to be up and clink in those prisons. And I can absolutely guarantee it that the Gender Recognition Act never would have passed a referendum in this country. There is no chance that people up and down the land would have rolled over and conceded to the idea that absolutely anybody who put his hands up and decided he wanted to fill out a single A4 page and get himself transferred into the women's estate or into the women's anywhere, it wouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. The only reason it did happen is because, as I said, we are working class people living under decisions made for us by the middle classes. And we, we've got to revisit the Gender Recognition Act. We've got to revisit a whole lot of things. But let me just stop it there and say, the women who are traumatized out of their minds in those prisons are having that experience because working class women were never consulted about the material reality of our own lives. So happy International Women's Day, everybody. 
Thank you, Rachel. Sorry. I, I'm, just in case uh, the audience are wondering, I've been operating off my phone here. That was a powerful, absolutely powerful presentation, Rachel. Thank you very much.